Welcome to HeartTube. My name is Jim Putnam. In this video, Steph and I are going to be refreshing our containers. We had summer annuals in and some shrubs and other things mixed uh, in our container display uh, during the uh, spring and summer. And of course, now it's almost November and we're going to be putting some pansies and snapdragons and uh, uh, violas and other things in them and also some conifers. And we want to just kind of talk through uh, the process of winter containers. Uh, a couple things to keep in mind is that not all containers are uh, will hold up to your winter conditions. So if the pot freezes solid, water expands and it can bust your pots, especially thin terracotta pots or you know this kind of super inexpensive terracotta pots are probably not best used. We have one terracotta pot in the in the landscape here, but it's a really really thick uh, container. It's had an azalea in it for a couple of years and it's held up fine. Or we use heavy concrete pots or some of these fiber pots. So this is a concrete container, but it's made to have less weight uh, and it has a fiberglass inside of it and they tend to hold up well in the winter, although not as well as a really heavy concrete pot would. But I think a lot of these are made uh, overseas and so part of the idea of having the fiberglass in them is also to lessen the shipping weight uh, as well. But they do hold up pretty well in the winter and they'll last, they'll last a few years. They tend to be a little less expensive than really, really heavy ones. Uh, and they're also easier to move around, you know, much, much lighter and easier to move around. The other thing on containers is we definitely want to make sure we have a hole uh, in the bottom of them. We don't want our, um, it doesn't matter what time of, what type of year you're planting your container, it needs to have a way for the water to get out of it. If you're putting the container directly on the soil, you need to have some sort of feet on the bottom of it, a couple bricks to set it on or something so that that hole doesn't become locked down to the soil. Because if it does, a couple things will happen. The roots of your plants will go out of the bottom and root into the ground and you'll have a hard time moving your container later. The other thing that can happen is the soil from underneath can seal up the hole and then it ends up filling up with water anyway. We've had, we've had that condition a couple times uh, in this landscape and then you go, oh yeah, 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 I need to raise the container up uh, just a bit. If you are setting your containers on wooden steps, things like that, you also want to raise them up because that water coming out of the bottom of the pot will definitely rot the wood if it sits there for a prolonged period of time. So keep that in mind. You, it's, going to keep the, it's going to keep the wood wet all the time to have your container sitting on it. So what type of materials are we using? One thing I think about for my winter containers is I want a little more drainage. Okay, so in the summer, I know my summer annuals are really going to be aggressive. It's hot outside, they're growing fast, and so I want to lean toward a mix that's a little more a uh, little more compost or peat moss if you're using peat moss or uh, whatever material that you're using. I want to lean more toward those wicking materials that can hold a little bit more water. In the winter time, my pansies aren't going to grow all that aggressively. Uh, I'm more likely to end up overwatering than underwatering, and so I go with a with more of a, a chunkier mix. And a lot of your potting soils you can look at will have. Um, this happens to be a stay green potting mix. We just bought a few that we could show you here. Uh, this is a stay green potting mix, and you can see the green prill here. Um, this is the same fertilizer I actually used in the nursery businesses. Um, a different company manufactures it for the nursery industry, but you'll see that green prill frequently um, in horticulture. You'll see it in some of the container plants you buy from nurseries. Um, that's Harold's fertilizer, and it's meant to last months and months. Uh, in the mixes that you get from them for the potting mixes, these are pretty good. Um, I don't particularly like the inorganic fertilizer on my on my on my plants at the house I'd rather use organic fertilizers but it's a great mix because it has this chunkiness to it it's a peat moss and bark mix and so it drains well but it does have some water uh, holding capacity not my, not at the top of my list but it is overall not a bad mix uh, if you have a super here's a seed starting mix and this is going to be vermiculite and uh, and peat moss mixed together. And you can see how thin this is. This is really gonna hold a lot of water. It's great for seed starting and that kind of thing, but in the winter time, I don't think this would, uh, this would drain well enough. Your pots would really, really be water bogged. Here's another mix bought at a box store that's similar to that stay green where it has the bark um, and peat mix. And it's got some vermiculite, or some, per sorry, some perlite in it. Those white little balls are perlite. If you think your mix is too is gonna retain too much water. You can use something like this perlite 
uh, to uh, help some to help with the drainage. We mix our own here, and um, I've got a bucket of compost here. This is actually soil cube compost that I had left over from the spring. Uh, it's uh, leaf mold, grass clippings from their sod farm, uh, and uh, sand. And it's a it's a it's a really good product. We've used it in the vegetable garden for a couple years. We can make our own compost. We're making our own compost here as well. And so we're using a compost and bark. This is pine bark uh, blend, which um, you know you can probably find in one of these one of these mixes. Uh, some sort of real fine pine bark, something that will help with the drainage, or a compost and uh, perlite blend, something like that, just to get a little bit of drainage in it. So I lean toward like in this container. In the summertime, I would lean toward lots of this compost uh, mixed with this bark. You know, I would probably mix it where it's more compost than bark. And the bark is just there for just a little bit of drink, a little bit of air uh, holding capacity because the roots do need air. And there's a little bit of drainage, but leaning, like, like I say, leaning more toward compost. My winter containers, I'm going to lean slightly more toward the bark. And so as I mix it, uh, I, want to, I want to see more of that bark uh, in the mix. And so uh, I fill the container that way. But again, I want a little more, little more of this bark uh, in the mix. And so it'll look a little, something about like that uh, is what I want it to, uh, to look like in my winter containers because I don't want to keep them too wet. And that's how I do it. It's just a real quick mix that's probably 60% bark and 50% and compost. Or, I mean, 40% compost. It's not 110%. <laughs> so it's about a 60-40 blend of bark. You can see what it looks like right there. If I can't find the bark, again, I can just use something like perlite, uh, the white material right there, uh, to create that drainage and mixing that in with the uh, compost. And it can be mushroom compost or... You know, it doesn't matter what type of compost it is. Everything composts down pretty much uh, in, a, in a similar fashion. But that is how we go about making our container mixes. And then I can get it in, in bulk quantities like this. It's a lot less expensive. We won't change out all the soil when we switch over to our summer annuals next year. And so the mix that we're using now for things that are going in, that's a little bit bark heavy. Uh, when, we, when we pull the pansies and dianthus or whatever's about to go in these containers out in the spring, we'll put more compost into those voids uh, to hold a little bit more moisture in. So that's how we transition from season to season without replacing everything in the container. At some point, a shrub has been in here long enough that it needs to come completely out and a lot of the soil needs to be taken off and it'll go back into the container. And it might, if it's being planted going into winter, might be a little more for drainage. And in the spring, it might be a little less for drainage, same as anything else. The shapes of the containers are important. We have way too many squares and rectangles and we don't have a formal garden. Everything here is done with curves, all the paths, the turf, everything is pretty much done with curves. And square and rectangular pots are really difficult to use except for on steps. Uh, and if, again, if you have some sort of formal garden. So keep that in mind, these, circle, these circles tend to fit uh, most most spaces a little better and uh, as we go forward we will have definitely have less rectangles and less squares. All right well I want to talk about the plants that you put in those containers that you've um, gotten ready for the fall and for the spring for that matter. Uh, before we even do that though I want you to think about your ability to, ability to water and the uh, what it takes to make sure those plants prosper. In the fall it's less of a problem because their needs are a lot more reduced you still have to go check, put your finger in there, like um, Jim says, and see if they need water before you do it. Uh, but in the summer, you're going to really have to be out there nearly every day, if not every day, uh, watering them. And if you go out of town, you either have to have an irrigation system that we have used, um, or you have to get somebody to come in and water them for you. You also have to think about hardiness. When you're planting your your planters in the summer, you can use just about any plant. Um, but in the fall, you kind of have to make sure that if you're using um, woody plants, you're going to have to make sure that there are two zones hardier than your zone where you live. Uh, most conifers for us are going to satisfy that. But 
the uh, annual department gets a little bit more complicated, of course, and there's a few that we use reliably. Another concern is cultural requirements. Um, I try to make sure that when I'm planting either in this, the fall or in the spring that the needs of the container, uh, container plants match. For instance, in the fall, I'm gonna make sure that when I put my sun-loving loving conifers in the containers, I'm also picking sun-loving annuals or ground covers to go in there with them. Uh, I wouldn't wanna put a sun-loving plant in with a shade-loving plant because I wouldn't be able to satisfy both of their needs. Another concern is uh, moisture requirements. Uh, I wouldn't put something that requires drier conditions, like an aloe or a sedum or something like that, in with something that requires a little more moisture. Neither one of them would be pleased with the results of me trying to keep both of them happy. I just couldn't do it. This past spring, Jim and I did a, a, a video about um, how to create containers on a budget. And we are always kind of thinking that way because there's no reason to pay for, for re things that we can find in our own landscape to fill our containers. Um, so I go around the landscape and see if I can find some of the ground covers especially that can be good fillers in my containers. Uh, I find things like wire vine. I find things like especially, this will go away soon, but in the spring, Creeping Jenny sedums, things like that. Other things we do, we propagate stuff ourselves, like we propagated this Viburnum davidi. Great texture in these leaves, really a good contrasting plant in a container. So our aims are to, to create the, land, um, the containers using things in our landscape sometimes. One other way that we save money in, in our containers uh, is to do a lot of our annuals from seed. Uh, in the fall, we don't really love growing pansies ourselves, so we're not gonna do that. But um, we could have made our, uh, grown our own snapdragons and dianthus and things like that. So when I'm making my containers, I wanna um, create a scene that includes a thriller, a spiller, and a filler. A lot of times, uh, the thriller will be something upright and the spiller obviously come over the sides, and the filler will be sort of a medium-sized thing to fill up the pot. Uh, in the fall, there's not as many uh, spillers out there. Asiatic jasmine, English ivy, um, wire vine. There's some other things you can use. In the, obviously, in the summertime, you've got um, vinca major and a whole lot of other things you can use. We've got this wonderful lit, little container that we've had for quite a while. We got it um, in the fall a couple years ago. It was about this size. Uh, it has been in this container long enough. I'm going to go ahead and move it into this larger size container and um, create other containers just like this was. All right, I'm easing it out of there so I can give it a little more room to live. One of the funny things about this is that we usually find a lot of our tags from what we've planted in there with it. Because we usually kind of tuck these in there in case we forget what we put or what it's called. And in this case, it's Twinkle Toes Japanese Cedar. Such a beautiful plant, but it needs a little more room. I'm gonna go ahead and pop this in here. I have a little too much soil, so I'm probably gonna take some of this out. This plant is gonna be so much happier with a little more room to grow. That said, I like to leave about an inch or so of space between the plant and the top of the planter so I can give it plenty of water when it needs it. Okay. All right. Okay, so we've got our plant in here. We're gonna think about what our, our fillers and spillers are gonna be. Another thing I like to do 
is to take my packs of plants, my annuals, and cut them with scissors so I can decide what color scheme I prefer. Do I want to add pansies in that are purple or go with the violas that are sort of a reddish purple? Or am I preferring to make it sort of a white toned? And do I want to make it monochromatic? Do I want to have all the same color? Or do I want to mix it in some? So in this case, I think I might go with a white color. So I'll go with my white pansies. And the reason I was able to do that is because I had them cut up and could move them around. So I'm gonna put that in there and then I'm gonna cover it with white pansies. All right, so I look at this and I'm like, eh, I don't think I actually want this in the middle because it doesn't give me much room to plant. So I'm just gonna move Mr. Twinkle Toes to the back so I can let the pansies have a little more room and whatever else I decide to plant with it. All right, so I've got my white pansy in here. I don't have to shove it in there quite as tightly. I got a little extra room. Also gives me some room to add this beautiful Ms. America uh, mustard. I love that I have a contrast in color, my white, my purple, and my lime green. I have a contrast in texture. I've got just these beautiful uh, mustard leaves versus the conifers, the little needles of this conifer. It's great contrast in both color and texture. It's just gonna be completely beautiful. A couple more whites in here. I have one other warning I'd like to say because I've done this before. I especially do this in the spring. Do not, with a, a, a conifer like this, plant a plant that gets almost as big as it. Because if they lay up against these needles and shade them, they're usually going to brown out and it's really going to be a problem for your conifer and you don't really want that. If I was going to create uh, the spiller here, I could do something like this wire vine that I have scavenged from my landscape and put it in here to come over the top. And then I'd have yet another um, type of foliage to contrast with um, texture and color. Just beautiful. So we repurposed one of our plants from last year into a larger container. It's ready to go. Leaves us with this great container to uh, plant some of our new uh, plants that we acquired. I'm gonna put a little bit more of the soil that Jim, Jim created in here. I'm gonna leave about an inch or so lip so the plant can get plenty of water. And I'm gonna take one of my plants, in this case it's gonna be the whipcord western red cedar. It sort of has a, not only a gorgeous habit, but I mean, look at it. The habit's sort of weeping and, and wonderful. So we're gonna add this to our container. And in this case, again, I'm putting it here to give myself plenty of planting room. And I'm gonna to think to myself, what colors do I want in this one? I'm going with orange in this case. I've got them all out. I could compare. In this case, I'm going with the orange. And I'm gonna plant some of these orange pansies in here. Will be good fall color too. That orange coming up with Thanksgiving. It's a smaller container, so I don't need a whole lot. I usually do like to have my plants in threes though. Or an odd number anyway. All right, so we have a little bit of a little bit of contrast with the, the texture there of those two items. So we've made a 
bunch of containers. We've kind of tried to contrast colors and textures to create a, a really pretty statement. We've got the whipcord thuja with the uh, uh, pansies. We've got this cotoneaster, got the red berries on it with our uh, violas. And um, we've got a topiary boxwood that Jim actually topiaried himself with the violas as well. Violas being a little colder hardy than the standard um, pansy. And in the back, uh, he also topiaried this beehive holly and I've placed it with uh, pansies or violas. Uh, it has some of the things from last year that I'm gonna cut back because obviously they're not gonna do a whole lot now. Like this vinca, I'm just gonna cut it back and then next year it'll come back out again. We've got Carex. Carex is a great choice for a container. Um, mums, a lot of people put mums in there but you need to realize they're not gonna last very long. Once this is done, it's done. So I like to, I prefer to use some of the mustards and um, violas and panolas and pansies. One other thing I really love a container is Swiss chard. They make all the different stemmed Swiss chard. Uh, we grew some from seeds to use in our containers and the rabbits, I think, decided that we didn't need them for our containers. Uh, so I might plant them anyway and let them come back, but they're not looking quite as, as, as good right now. So. Uh, we haven't put them in right now. So a beautiful selection of what you can do for your winter containers. So the big container that Steph did got new bark and compost, and then the second container got new bark and compost. The other containers, she just, you, you can see in the sped up part, she just pulled out some of the old soil and then put some new compost and uh, bark mix in there. You have to think about that, uh, these organic, uh, things like the compost, barks and, uh, and, and peat moss and perlite and all these other things, they don't have the same nutrients that actual soil has, that actual rock dust has. And so you need to, need to think about replacing some of that occasionally. Uh, this uh, beehive holly that was limbed up has been in this container now for a little over a year. At some point, like in the spring, it probably needs to come out and, and, and really a lot of fresh soil be added to this container. So at some point, uh, it would appreciate having almost all the soil in that container replaced. We fertilize with organic fertilizers, so we'll top dress these things because we are trying to get a little growth out of these pansies and panolas and violas uh, for the winter and the mustard as well. Uh, but we don't do a whole lot of pushing of our containers. Uh, the, you know, I've said this before, the more you push these plants, the more you force these plants to grow, uh, the more susceptible you are to insect problems. It's not as much in the winter time, but definitely during the growing season. Uh, you'll see a lot of links between, I fertilize every week and let me show you how to control these, these problems that this plant has, because uh, it does stress the plants to grow uh, too fast. And so again, organic fertilizer now, organic fertilizer in the late winter. We'll come in here, the shrubs that have been in the containers for a long time will probably get flipped out new soil added, the one that she just put in a container now, like the Cotoneaster and this, uh, and this Cryptomeria that was just potted up, or Japanese cedar that was just potted up, won't need new soil. They'll just get a little bit of new soil and uh, new annuals uh, at that time. Again, this channel is all about, you know, trying to, trying to get a, you know, a bang for the buck. And so these little tiny conifers that you can get this time of year, we put one in a container here, this little cotoneaster. Next year, it can go into this middle-sized container. The year after that, it could go into a large container so we can keep repurposing it, keeping it in good shape, like Steph said, not putting things too crowded up around them. And then also, we're rooting plants here. You know, so the, you know, there's things like viburnums and you know, she put a viburnum in the back of this container uh, right here that we rooted, that David viburnum. And then most of the annuals we typically do from seed, although this time of year, our snapdragons and dianthus and pansies, we did purchase more uh, of. But uh, in the spring, you'll see all of us, you know, doing them from seed. So the things that replace these things will be done as inexpensively as possible. Um, you know, getting the most bang for your buck on a limited, uh, on a limited budget. So thank you guys for following along uh, with the channel. And uh, don't forget to subscribe because we actually, this is only five containers here. We have lots more pieces to put into other containers and we'll be showing those and some walkthrough videos. Thanks for watching.